does, you know. Go ahead and be seated this morning. God is so good. And God is so good to me. Wednesday night, Chris followed me out to my car after service, and he said, I know that you're speaking, and I don't really ever do this. But is there a song you would like me to prepare? And I said, I have a song. He said, I know you do. and You all know I do. But I told him an old, old song, and he began to pray. He said, I don't think I can sing that one. It's okay because the Lord didn't want that song, Chris. But this last two songs this morning, oh, how he loves us. He's a good, good father. It's who he is. And I'm loved. It's who I am. It's who I am. And then this song, oh, how he loves us. It, it, it's the songs that confirm to me that this word truly is from God and not from me. And I like to know that. I got to tell you, for more than a month, there's been a song in the Christian pop charts that you may have heard, and it's been bouncing around inside my head, looking for a way out by, a, by form of a message. So I was excited when Pastor said, I'm going to be out of town. Can you speak? And I Yes, finally the song can get out of my head. It's an incredible song. It's called No Longer Slaves. But that's not the part that, that has been speaking to me. It's the fact that I am, you are, a child of God. So, John, if you've got that song, would you put it up? And I want you to just open your heart and your mind. And, and I pray that the spirit of the living God touches you the way he touches me when this song is played. So go ahead and listen. Thank you for this incredible opportunity to be called a child of God. And I'd ask that you use this word this morning to set people free to the point Lord, where they can stand and confidently and boldly say, I am, I am a child of God. Amen. More and more church, I encounter people who don't seem to have fully grasped who God is or what God has done for us. Now, I know that most of us know it here, but not enough of us, of us know it here. And there's a big difference. I want you to grab your Bible and look at Ephesians chapter 3, chap I'm sorry, chapter 1, verses 3 to 5. And I want you to note the words that Paul uses to describe you. He said, bless. And, and this, when you read this, you've got to know this guy knew who he was. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ, just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love, having predestined us to adoptions as sons by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will. Look at those words. He's talking about you. Blessed, chosen, predestined, accepted. And then don't miss that word, adoption. He's speaking them over you. Those aren't just really cool words. Those describe you today. They're written and recorded in God's word to make it clear that we are indeed his children. And that leads to my topic this morning, if a child. If you're a child of God, if we're children of God, what prevents us from acting and living as such? I can think of a lot of different things, but I want to highlight just three this morning. I want to start with the first, and that is fear. A friend recently sent me something that I've seen since on Facebook, and I, I don't know who to give credit to for it, but it says, there isn't enough room in your life for both fear and faith. Each day, you must decide which one gets to stay. There's a choice you make, and I would probably say several times a day, you have to decide who gets to stay. The best way that I can describe fear is that it's a bondage, something that 
renders a person unable to move forward, locking them in indecision. It's a trap. Fear is a trap. Now, God has a lot to say about fear in his word, but most of it is by way of admonition not to get caught up in it and that it is not from him. In fact, most of you are familiar with 1 Timothy 1.7 where it says, God has not given you a spirit of fear, but of power and love and a sound mind. So what you have here is an example of God spotlighting the enemy's work. And then he counters it with his handiwork. He says, fear, it's not from me. From me you get power and love and a sound mind. Every time you face fear, every time it rises up to greet you, you can absolutely with all certainty know God did not send it. It does not come from God. It's from the enemy of your soul who brought it to you. Now, I want you to look at 1 John chapter 4, verse 18 for a slightly less familiar verse. It says, there's no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear. Perfect love casts out fear. Can we agree that God is love perfected? Perfect love casts out fear. Let me change that. God casts out fear. God's love defined. And thinking back to the lyrics of that song, it says, he surrounds us with a song of deliverance from our enemy until all our fears are gone. I want you to get that in your mind's eye when fear comes up to greet you. God is speaking or singing over you songs of deliverance. And he continues to sing them until your fears are gone. Now, when it comes to fear, beloved, you have two choices every time. You can give in to the lie, the lie that it is, and submit to it, or you can call it what it is, a lie. Call it what it is and face, focus on the idea again that God's surrounding you and surrounding you with songs of deliverance, and he'll keep doing it till the fear is gone. You get to choose. Take it or call it what it is. When fear comes, call it what it is. Your fear. Name it. Your fear. So therefore, you can't be from God. So I'm not going to spend my time and my energy focusing on that fear. I'm going to focus on that, the fact that I've got a God who's standing and singing songs of deliverance for me. Right. He's singing my way out of fear. Yes. I just have to agree with him. Fear's real. And I, I don't know that I've ever met a person who has not experienced fear. If anybody tries to tell you, well, I've never faced fear, they're not being truthful with you. Fear is very real. And I think that as long as we walk around in these earthly tents we call the human body, fear is going to come again and again to try to distort our thinking. It's going to come to try to knock us off our course every chance it gets. The key is knowing how to respond to fear and then doing it. Knowledge is good, but it does me no good if I don't do something with it. So I have to know that it's not from him. And I know that I have to rebuke it and turn away from it. Now, God spoke truth to us, did he not? He gave us truth to win the battle. He gave us truth to defeat fear. Now, I'm, I'm going to be honest with you and say, it's not always a quick skirmish. There are times that fear comes and wham, right between my eyes, I get it. And I, I see it and I call it a lie. And I say that I choose to believe, but it doesn't immediately go away. It's a battle that has to be fought. And a strong believer will fight to the finish, not by themselves, but with God. With God. He's the one who wins the battles. We just fight. I'm, I'm mindful of, a, of an email I received this week from my sister. She got a, a very difficult diagnosis for her son. Pray for my, my nephew, Adam, if you will. He's a young man in his mid-20s. Adam has juvenile diabetes, so he's had diabetes for 20 years. And he's got a nasty cardiac history, and he's having some very significant problems. His heart rate, his resting heart rate is dropping down to as low as 37. His heart is slowing down, and they don't quite yet know why. And she's his mama. And what I hear her saying in her email is, I am speaking the truth 
over myself because I'm afraid. I'm speaking the truth of God that everything that comes to us has been lovingly sifted through the hands of God so there's a way out of this. And I will speak it until I feel it. That's what we're supposed to do. Not give in to it. We have to consciously choose to reject the lie. The lie that fear is. The second thing I want to focus on that prevents people from living as a child of God is bitterness. Bitterness. You got to get this one, church. There are too many believers. Yes, I say believers caught up in bitterness. Bitterness can be defined as enmity, or better yet, as being sour-tempered. Bitter people are tough to be around. It's tough to spend much time with them, but God speaks of bitterness in his word as well, and it's always to say, avoid it. Move yourself away from it. Separate yourself from it because bitterness sours things. Bitterness is so sour, it slowly but surely sucks the life out of things. Bitterness brings death. Ultimately, it kills. I have talked to a number of people who I can just see are full of potential. A number of young men and young women have come across my path, but life's been hard. And they've held on to the hurt and they become bitter. And that bitterness stands between them and what they could be doing for the kingdom of God. Bitterness needs to be dealt with. In the book of Acts, Peter at one point um, comes across a man by the name of Simon. Simon was a sorcerer. And he says to him, you've been poisoned by your own bitterness. You have cut short your spiritual life by your own bitterness. Not only was this Simon repelling people, he was short-circuiting his own life and his own potential. And in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 15, it talks about bitterness at well. It says, look carefully, lest anyone fall short of the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness spring up. Why? Because it causes trouble and many become defiled. People who walk around with a spirit of bitterness defile other people. When you are around people who are bitter, you know it and you walk away thinking, ooh, this doesn't feel right. And it's not right. And you may need to pray about it. Bitterness isn't pleasant to anybody, but ultimately it's the one who holds fast to it who is destroyed by it. This ought not be so. Christians ought not be destroyed by bitterness. Remember who we are? It says here again from the song, from my mother's womb, you've chosen me. Love is called my name. I have been born again into your family. Your love flows through my veins. My identity is in him. So the key to addressing bitterness is, I think, is found in the 139th Psalm. David was acquainted with hardness. David had his share of pain and hurt delivered. And here's what he's saying about it. He says, search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my anxieties. And see if there's any wicked way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. I'll tell you what, church, bitterness is wicked. If there's bitterness in you, then there's a wicked way in you. And you ought to be like David. You ought to make this a regular prayer. We ought to go to God often, regularly, and say, check my heart. Check my heart, Lord. Did something worm its way in there? We live in a fallen world. And some of that fallen is going to get on us. It's going to splash on us and then attempt to defile us. It happens. Yes, many of you say, yeah, I know that experience. I've, I've been that stuff splashed on me. And I need to go to God and say, search me. See if it's sticking. And when you have the courage to pray that prayer, then you've got to get quiet. Let the Holy Spirit do the searching and let the Holy Spirit tell you the truth about yourself. He longs to see you free of those things 
but you've got to know they're there. You've got to have the courage to face them, to get beyond them, to let the Holy Spirit do what he wants to do. Let him reveal any bitterness that needs to be uprooted. The final thing that I want to highlight this morning is unforgiveness. That's perhaps the most subtle of these three that I've mentioned. And I say it's the most subtle because we Americans have an incredible ability to rationalize and justify our sins. We call it other things. We call it wisdom sometimes. I'm just too wise. Really. Call it other things. The truth is that unforgiveness is a spirit, and it's not a Holy Spirit. Unforgiveness truly is nothing more than a choice, and at best it's an unwise choice. Because unforgiveness does not do what you intend for it to do. Unforgiveness does not bind up the other person. It binds up you. It locks you. It does the opposite of what you intended to do. They're not affected. They're not impacted by your unforgiveness. You are. You are. Unforgiveness is willingly choosing not to forgive somebody. And that's just plain scary. Many of you know why it's scary. Just after teaching his disciples the Lord's Prayer in Matthew 6, 6, 9 to 13 is the Lord's Prayer. In verses 14 and 15, he says, if you forgive men their trespasses, your Heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you don't forgive them, neither will your Father forgive you. Wow. Jesus said, in order to be right with God, you need to forgive other people. And I don't think for a minute that Jesus was talking about just saying the words to a person just to cover our spiritual backside. Uh-uh. Jesus said, I want you to get to the heart of it. I want you to get to the root of it. Heart forgiveness. We have an ability to remember things. You must forgive. You may not be able to forget, but you must be able to forgive. Now, I'm going to tell you, it's hard. It may take a determined effort on our part to forgive somebody. But God is faithful, and he won't leave you alone. You're his child, and he will walk with you through that to forgiveness. If we're honest about our feelings and saying, God, I just can't, I can't, then we've got to get her and say, God, I want to forgive. Help me. I know that firsthand by experience that I did that. Many of you heard that testimony I've given. There was somebody who had deeply offended me. And I, I won't even mince words. I hated that person with vile hatred. Until the Lord said, not good. And I did. I started in my knees saying, God, I want to, but I can't. You must. I choose to forgive. I must have said that for months till one day I realized it just wasn't powerful anymore. It had no power over me. What that person did hasn't changed. That person never came and said, I'm sorry, but that person and I can share a room today and be just fine. We'll never be best buds, but I can pray a blessing over her and feel no animosity at all. It wasn't instantaneous. It wasn't overnight. It was weeks or months. But our souls hang in the balance. And isn't it worth it then? Isn't your soul worth a few months of prayer? Mine is. God is more than faithful, and he will help us work through it. Now then, if we are the children of God, how then do we live? It says again, we've been liberated from our bondage. We're the sons and the daughters. Let us sing our freedom. I love this part. You split the sea so I could walk right through it. All my fears were drowned in perfect love. You rescued me so I could stand and sing, I am a child of God. A child of God, beloved, walks in freedom. In John 8, 36, Jesus said, if the Son makes you free, you'll be free indeed. And if you looked at Galatians 5.1, I'm not sure I gave that verse, um, it says Paul affirms that Jesus has indeed set us free. 
Jesus did set us free. If, you, says that he set, if he set you free, you're free indeed. He did. But like every other gift, you have to choose to accept it. You have to choose freedom. Sin took you captive, and it threw you into a cell. And I want you to bear with me for a minute, and I want you to picture in your mind that you're walking through life, and you're minding your own business, and you're doing your own thing. And all of a sudden, someone grabs you, throws you into this room. You hear the door slam. You hear the key go lock. And you begin to scream, I want out. And you beat on every wall, and you push against every wall, and you're looking and looking and looking for a way out, but you're in bondage, and there's nothing you can do to get out. And you scream till you can't scream anymore. And you cry till your tears are done. And you just slump to the floor, defeated, dejected, and lost. And you're there for you don't know how long. Then you hear a click, and you hear a door latch, and you sense a presence sitting on the floor next to you. Do you dare look up to see Jesus sitting next to you, showing you the door is wide open? You're free to go. He's done that for every person who's come to the altar and asked him to be Lord and Savior. But far too many have got that slave mentality. They've been in that cage so long. They don't know that really they trust anybody. I think the trust is I'll get up and I'll go to the door and the door will slam shut again, so I'm not going to get up. I'll ask, is that really Jesus? Is this just another trick? And so we sit there. And at some point, we look up and we think, I, I got nothing to lose. And we take the hand of Jesus and we stand up and we walk through the door. Because in Revelation, it says that Jesus has the keys. The problem, church, is that too often we're not willing to walk out the door that's been opened. We choose to stay locked in our own sin. And I will say this to you, walking in freedom takes practice. Walking in freedom takes practice. When you have got a slave mentality, you don't automatically walk like a child of God. Remember the, the Israelites coming out of Egypt? They'd been in slavery for hundreds of years. They didn't know how to be a people. They didn't have an identity. God had to walk with them until they gained an identity. He fed them. He watered them. He opened the rivers for them. He split the sea and they walked right through. God's doing the same thing for you. A slave doesn't gain a whole identity at the moment they walk out of the cell. It comes at time. Time as you test everything and find that it's sure to find that it's true. How do you do that? You read the word of God. You read what he says about you and you choose to believe what he says. Just like fear and faith can't coexist, neither can God and Satan. You have to choose whose word about you are you going to believe. God says you're redeemed, you're saved, you're adopted, you're predestined, you're blessed, you're favored. The enemy says you're unworthy, you're guilty, you're a sinner, you're devious, you're hopeless, you're worthless, and you're doomed. Who are you going to choose to believe? It comes down to that. It's a battle. You don't walk from slavery to freedom instantaneously. You've got to read what God says about you, and you have to say, I choose to believe it. I am a child of God. I don't care what you say, liar. Liar. I dare you to call him a liar to his face. Do it out loud so you can hear it with your own ears. He's a liar. You're unworthy. I'm not. You're unloved. Nope. You're doomed. Try again. You're talking to a child of God. 
Remember the four-word phrase? Anybody remember it? What do you tell the enemy? It's under the blood. You lose. I didn't get here by the first day I picked the Bible. It's a process of coming to know who you are. Try him. Try Jesus. I guarantee you, money back guarantee, you will find he's trusted. He's sure. He holds the key. He holds the key of sin and death. The enemy has no power to put you back into bondage. He doesn't have a key to lock the door anymore. What happens is the enemy tells you a bill of goods, and you say, okay, I'm no good. I'm going to sit in the room again. I'll even slam the door, but you can't lock it because the enemy doesn't have the keys, and neither do you. Who are you going to believe? He does. He tells us all the time how unworthy we are. And he's going to until you stand up and say, no, no. The enemy no longer attacks my understanding of who I am. He knows it's a waste of his time and his energy. Does that mean he never attacks me in other areas? No. He's always coming at me. But when you get to the point where you know that you know that you know, when like Paul, you can say, I know him in whom I have believed that he's able to keep me. When you get there, the battle in that area in your life is gone and you walk in freedom. Child of God also walks in hope. Hope is nothing more than the expectation of future good. And if you're a, bel if you're a believer, you have lots to hope for. The word talks a lot about our future. It talks about heaven and my head can't even comprehend how awesome it's going to be. I can't imagine. But it has so much to say. If you're a child of God, the word promises you a very good future. In Romans 15, 4, he tells us that the word of God is a source of our hope. How can it not be? When it tells us all these good things about ourselves, it talks about our restoration, our deliverance, our salvation. All these good things is how can it not be? In Titus, Paul says it, the hope set forth by God's promise of eternal life. Scripture has tons of things to say about our hope. As his children, we should be looking forward to that. You know, I always say I'm looking to the east all the time because that's where Christ is going to come back for us. We should always be looking toward our hope. I heard a bit of a testimony this morning of a sister in the prayer room says, I used to be afraid to die, but I'm not anymore. She's figured it out. It's hope, isn't it, sister? It's hope you're looking forward to. We should be like little kids. Remember what it was like in December? December 1st to the 24th, if you had little kids in your house and they know what Christmas is? The expectation, the joy, they're looking for all the good things that are going to come on Christmas Day. If we knew, if we really knew, we'd be the same thing. I know it's coming. Streets of gold. No more darkness. Pure, clean water and fruit that trees that bear fruit all year round. It's an awesome place. No more tears. No more sorrow. No more pain or sickness. I am so excited for those days. I can hardly wait to run and run and run. You won't find me for the first generation in heaven because I'll have to be running the hills pain free. My head thrown back, just laughing my brains out. There's hope. We should live in hope. And the last one, a child of God walks by faith. You know the definition of faith in Hebrews 11.1. 1. It's the substance of things unseen, things hoped for, I'm sorry, the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. It's also been defined as confidence in the testimony of another. Believing in the testimony of another. That other church is Jesus. It's Jesus Christ. And his word gives testimony to all that he's done for us, all that he will do for us. It's by faith. It's taking him at his word and saying, yes. Jesus said, I made you free. Saying, yes. I have made you holy. Yes. I have restored you. Yes. I believe it. I believe it. Taking him at his word 
even when we can't see it. You can't see heaven. But when you take him at his word and you live your life like that, you'll walk with success. In Habakkuk, Habakkuk chapter 2, verse 4, it says, the just shall live by his faith. That's true. We do live by what we believe. Whether we believe that it's hopeless, and so are we, or it's hopeful, and so are we. We live by what we believe. Not by what we say, but what we believe in our heart. You may stand here and say, I'm a child of God. And your heart think, I'm just not worthy. I don't measure up. You got to get your heart and your mouth in agreement. Because you will live by what you believe. Not by what you say, but by what you believe. And in closing today, I want to make it clear that this identity, this accepting and, and living as children of God doesn't happen all at once. There isn't a timetable. It's not chronological. It certainly doesn't happen all at once, and you don't get it by hanging around people who know God. You get it on your own. God doesn't have grandchildren. Oh, I did, wish he did. Because then I'd be in life lit. God has only children. And you've got to figure it out for yourself. You have to forge your own relationship for him. We get that identity into our nature, into our character, by spending time with him. And the only tangible thing that I have of Jesus Christ is my word. It's his word, but it's mine. That's the tangible thing I have. So I'm in his word reading about him, reading about me, what he says about him. What does he have to say about me? In his word, he tells us there's one way that he'll know if we love him. And isn't that what we all want? Don't we all want to know that we're loved? Yeah, we do. Words mean nothing in and of themselves, do they? That old saying, the proof's in the pudding, I never quite got that. But in our vernacular today is, show me, prove it, prove that you love me. In John chapter 14, verse 15, Jesus tells us how we'll know. He says, my, they'll know that you are mine. I'll know that you love me if you keep my commands, if you keep my word. Jesus was not on a power trip here. It wasn't about him being Lord of all and the great and mighty Puah, and we're just the lowly servants. It wasn't that at all. It was Jesus knowing that he had perfection, and he made it available to us. And if we would just do what he asks of us, we'd have that happiness that we, that we desire, that we're after. He's directing us to live our lives the way he wants it lived, because he wants what's best for us. Walk in relationship with Jesus like every other relationship takes time. Quantity and quality. We trust him one step at a time, and he proves he's worth that trust. More and more, we give away ourselves as we trust him. My heart's prayer this morning is that every one of you would come to an understanding and acceptance of who you are and whose you are. I remember my kids were younger. When they were leaving home for an activity, I'd say, remember whose kid you are. And I checked this yesterday. When I said that my kids knew I wasn't talking about their dad and me, they knew I was talking about God. So you go out there, out from under our cover, remember whose kid you are, their heavenly father. So today I say to you, remember whose kid you are. What you do, where you go, what you say, what you entertain, remember whose kid you are. If you remember whose kid you are, chances are you won't do many dumb things. If you've identified with this this morning, and you sense a need, my desire for you is that you will come to a place and a walk with him that you understand I am 
a child of God. I'm accepted. I'm valued. I have a place where I belong. Being a child of God won't make you rich. It won't give you everything your heart desires. But it will give you is a sense of peace and purpose and direction. And life will be, indeed, good. You will sleep well at night. And like Horatio Spofford, that you don't know that name, you'll be able to stand and say, it is well with my soul. He wrote that song. When peace like a river attendeth my way, when sorrow like sea billows roll, whatever I face, whatever, you've taught me to say, it is well with my soul. If you don't know, he just received news that his family had been lost in a sea ship, sea wreck. He stood at the seashore and he said, it's well with my soul. If you come to that place where you know I'm a child of God, you'll be able to say, come what may, it is well with my soul. So if you've identified with one of these things this morning, either one of the things that are keeping you from walking in your identity, or perhaps you're walking in your identity and you feel like, I just need a boost. I need someone to come alongside me and pray with me. Then I ask you to come now because we want to pray with you. God's in the house. He's more than ready to hear your prayer. Whether you need a fresh start, whether you need a correction, or, or maybe you don't even know the Lord. Maybe you've never met him personally. I would love nothing more than to introduce you to my Jesus. He's all that you could want. He's all that you could need. So church, if you've got a need this morning, please don't sit there. Come. Come and we will pray with you. Never.